thank you so much for coming today. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And praise the Lord, his mercies are new every morning. And if not, we would be consumed. And so I'm so thankful every single day we wake up, we have new mercies from God. And that's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for coming to church today. And uh, we will turn our hymn books to page 276, where no one stands alone. This one's not too well known, so this will be exciting. Maybe you'll learn a new song today. Song number 276, page 276, where no one stands alone. On the first verse, page 276. Lesson in the bulletin if you open it and you happen 
to notice it's upside down. I did that on purpose just to teach us as people that, hey, sometimes pastors make mistakes. And so uh, I was just trying to test your forgiveness to see, uh, make sure you guys are forgiving today and remembering to do that. So praise the Lord. Well, actually, the problem was my, I put my printer in upside down. So uh, my printer was printing upside down. So that's why. You know what? They do notice it. And yes, I made a mistake, but that's to teach you, hey, pastors need forgiveness. Amen. And so I'm thankful for that. But if you want to open that up there, look in there. Today's May the 21st. And I've got some upcoming events here. Of course, we have our soul winning every Saturday. That's exciting. That's soul winning yesterday. That's a big come out with soul winning. And I'm thankful for people faithful to doing the work of the Lord and going out and trying to be a blessing and doing their part and share the message. And also to remind us, hey, let's remember that. Uh, you don't have to go soul winning just on Saturday. Uh, when you're at work, praise God, you can go soul winning. But the Mike shared with me, giving the gospel to someone at his work, and others have done the same thing. And uh, you can go soul winning at work. Guess what? You can do it in the grocery store. You can even try and do it through the drive through Now, most people try to push you through, but you can try it. And uh, you can lead people to Christ anywhere. And so let's remember to see that soul winning is not just something we do on a Saturday, but it's who we are. It's what we do every day of the week. Uh, whenever we get a chance, hey, we're trying to talk to people about the Lord. Uh, Sunday school breakfast, we had a wonderful breakfast this morning. Had some Panera bread bagels. Amen. The yeah. Lord God got some extras over there. So if you need some lunch, sneak over there and take a few bagels home with you. And uh, praise the Lord for that. But just a great day today. A few upcoming events. Uh, May the 22nd tomorrow is the last night of the Grace Baptist Bible Institute. That's down in Chesapeake, Virginia at Chesapeake Baptist Church. Just wanted to put that out there, and tomorrow will be the last night for that. That will be tomorrow night at 7. And uh, that's a, a really good time for men to just get some extra preaching and teaching of God's Word. Uh, next Sunday, May the 28th, is our birthday Sunday. What that is, is we're going to celebrate everyone's birthday that day. Uh, some people like to keep their birthdays quiet, and they don't like to tell Pastor because they don't want to be embarrassed. And then a week later, they say, oh yeah, by the way, Pastor, it's my birthday. You know? And they didn't tell me because they didn't want the attention, so next week... It's, we're going to celebrate everyone's birthday next Sunday. You won't want to miss it. That'll be a great time. We'll have fun. So that will be next Sunday, um, June the 3rd. We'll have our Super Saturday of Soul Winning like normal. And June 18th, uh, the Scary family will be here. That is my sister and her husband, my sister and brother-in-law. They are going to missionaries to uh, Italy. And there's a little island, uh, well, it's a big island off of the coast of Italy called Sardinia. And there's another missionary family over there um, that... Uh, that we have sent over there uh, from the Chesapeake Baptist Church, and they're going to go over there and join them. And what they're going to do is they're going to go to Sardinia and plant churches, just like we're doing over here. They're going to do it in Sardinia, Italy, and they're going to find a location, start a second church, and then try and eventually plant a third church. And I'll be praying for them, but they're going to come and present their work. You'll get to meet them. And some of you met them already. They came out. They surprised me. And when we had our bounce, bounce house Sunday in February, uh, they came out and showed up out here and helped us out. And while they were here, they were just leading people to Christ, giving people the gospel, and just being a blessing, being missionaries here in Virginia. And so they're going to do the same thing over there that they're doing over here. And you won't want to miss that day. That'll be June the 18th. That's coming up um, in about a month. And that'll be a special day. Please make sure you mark that down on your calendar and be here for that. Um, also, Pastor Whitehouse and family will be back next Sunday. Please be praying for safe travels for them. And also condolences for Miss Faith's family in the loss of her father. And let's remember to pray for them and uh, praise the Lord for that. All right, we're going to sing another song here. And this is going to be page 394, I Need Thee Every Hour. That's song number 394. We'll all stand if you could uh, grab your hymnal, hymnals there. And then we'll all stand and turn to page 394, <coughs> I Need Thee Every Hour, page 394. Oh, we'll do this one with the piano. That'd be great. Uh, we're doing 394 and not 268, right? Oh, did I skip a song? Oh, no. We're not going to skip a song. We need to sing it. Let's do 268. Thank you, Brother Jeff. I told you, Pastor, to make mistakes. We need lots of forgiveness. So I'm, I'm testing the limits of, of your forgiveness today. And so today is a test. And let's see who passes the test. Song, <laughs> uh, page number 268, every hour, every day. We'll sing that. Page 268.
we'll sing a verse of that, and then we'll get around and shake some hands. Now we're going to sing I Need Thee Every Hour, Psalm 394. We'll sing a verse of that, get around, and greet one another. Song number 394.
Everyone else, you may be seated. We'll keep you standing any longer. Thank you for that. All right, thank you for your faithfulness to giving. Thank you for being here and being part of Peninsula Baptist Church. And uh, the Lord, the Lord notices that and he'll bless you for it. And I know he's thankful that we are faithful. And so continually faithfully serving God and uh, putting him first and priorities in your life makes a difference. And so I'm thankful for those who are faithful to giving and uh, being here at Peninsula Baptist Church. Thank you for that. Brother Mike, you can pray for you all. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a part of what we, get, what we get from you, Lord. We pray that you bless the hands that give, bless what we give to the work that you have it to do. And thank you for what you did so that we can. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious name that we ask and pray. Amen.
it's been a long week or so. Uh, Miss Faith, of course, we found out about her dad. And then also in this last week, um, my brother-in-law also passed away, 24 years of age, just a young man. And so that song really speaks a lot to me. And if I'm a little bit more emotional this morning than normal, I apologize. But praise the Lord, God is good, and we look to him for strength and for comfort. And uh, the uh, maybe we're not, or you're not going through a tough time today, but I can promise you one day it's coming. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I've thought that before, and I've said that before myself. And uh, we, we need to learn the, uh, the answer before the trial comes. We need to learn that. We need to lean on God for everything uh, before that hard time comes. Because when it comes, um, if, you don't have, if you don't know where to go or if you don't know what to do, it makes it a lot harder. And you can make emotional decisions, and your emotions can control you. And so uh, the emotions are not bad, but we want to make sure that we are in control and that when those things happen, that, hey, we know where to go. We know to go to God and to his people, not to run away from church, but run to the church and to the family of God for comfort and for strength. And so uh, definitely some lessons we've learned. It's been a long few days, but praise the Lord for that. Let's be in Nehemiah. Uh, turn your Bible to Nehemiah chapter number 8. We've been going through the book of Nehemiah on Sunday mornings, and I think it's been helpful. I hope it's been a blessing. It's been exciting and, and uh, lear uh, learning for me just to preach through the book of Nehemiah and the great truths that you find in this small little book of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 8, if you're a preacher or desire to be one, you need to know this chapter. You need to know the story of Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, I first heard it preached uh, many, many years ago. By my dad. Um, I've read through this story very many times myself. I've studied it before. And what it is, is it's almost like a church service that you find in the Old Testament. And so we'll, we'll look at that this morning. I think it'll be encouragement to you. But just to bring you up to date and up to speed, um, in the book of Nehemiah, of course, Nehemiah is a man that goes back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, has been conquered, and he has been carried away in the captivity to a faraway land. And in that faraway land, God puts a burden on Nehemiah's heart about the, his hometown, the city of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, uh, but the Lord encouraged him and, and said, hey, go talk to the king. And so he goes to the king and he tells the king, hey, I want to go back to my home city, my hometown, and rebuild Jerusalem. Will you let me go? The king lets him go. Not only that, he gives him money. He gives him a guard that, that takes him on his way. He says, hey, you need any wood. Here, here, here's a letter. Take it to the, uh, to the uh, keeper of the woods for the king, and he will give you all the wood and you know, anything that you need. We can help you with that. I want to support you in going and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the walls and the gates. The walls have been broken down. You think, you know, catapults or trebuchets, whatever. They came and they destroyed all the walls. You've got rubbish all over the place, destruction. You've got all the rubble laying there. The gates have been burned with fire, so there's no gates now, um, and the enemy can just come in whenever they want. And so Nehemiah goes back, and he looks at the situation, and he endeavors to rally the people God's people there in Jerusalem to build a great work, and that's the walls of Jerusalem. It takes them 52 days, and they finish the walls of Jerusalem. We looked at that a few weeks ago. But there's more lessons to be learned, because as all of us are building our lives, we're building our, our uh, relationship with God, and then we're building our Christian home, trying to protect our home from the world and sin and Satan. Um, we're, we have to build those walls first. If you don't build the walls, the enemy's going to get in. So the first step is, hey, get saved. Start building your wall. And then once you've built that wall of protection, which we also have a wall of protection around the same end. We don't want the wolves to come in. And so we build those walls. Well, then you'll find that after we build the walls, the job is not done because there's maintenance on the walls. There's uh, the enemy is surrounding you. They're, they're going around the walls looking for any way to get in. And so we looked a couple weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, I believe it was, at how uh, – little foxes try to get in. They try to get into a little hole, or they try to, if the, if the wall breaks down, they try to climb over it, or they try to dig and go under the wall. And so we made some applications there about how we need to protect against those little things. Um, but we do need to guard those walls. This is sort of after that has happened in the story, and Nehemiah gathers the people together and, and, and basically tells them, hey, you've done a great work for God. You've built these walls up, but you have to remember, you have to live your life by the word of God. Because if you build your walls and you protect your home, well, that's great. But if you don't live the rest of your life by the Bible, you can lose all that you've built to protect. 
You can lose your children if you don't teach them the importance of God's word. Amen? And just because they grow up in a sheltered home does not mean that they will go out and do the same unless you teach them God's word so that they know it for themselves, so that they decide for themselves, hey, I'm going to live my life by the Bible. And so today, I'm entitled to sermon, The Importance of the Word of God or The Importance of Living Your Life by the Bible. If you found your place there in Nehemiah chapter 8, if we could all stand together for the reading of God's word. Nehemiah chapter 8, and what we'll do is we'll read verses 1, 2, and 3, all, uh, and we'll do ver uh, 1 through 3 all together, verses 1, 2, and 3 all in unison, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. Ready? And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So you can see the picture there. Nehemiah gathers all the people there together, and uh, he gets Moses, the priest, or the prophet, or the scribe there, um, the, the preacher, if you will, and he comes up, and it, you'll see later, he stands upon a pulpit of wood, and he preaches the word, he reads the Bible to them. But then he preaches it to them. And what does that mean? As a preacher, this is something we need to know. Hey, this is what preaching is. This is a picture of it way back in the Old Testament. But also, it will encourage us. And you'll notice for these people the importance of the Word of God. And you'll find later on in the chapter how long they just came back and listened to the Word of God. It wasn't just a 30-minute sermon on a Sunday. It wasn't even just a whole day of, of it. It was, it was day after day. And you'll see that later on in the story. But you cannot read this chapter. You cannot read this chapter and not see the importance of the Word of God in these people's lives. And so, hopefully, this will be a blessing to you. Before we go any further, let's go, to the Lord, in prayer. Dear Lord God, we love you. We need you, God. I pray that you would help us all, Lord, everyone that's in here, that we would endeavor to live our lives by the Bible. Lord, the world tries to put down the importance of God's Word and say, no, you need these uh, self-help books, or you need these motivational speakers, or no, you just need to be happy and be positive, and uh, the power of positive thinking, and all these things. But in reality, Lord, what we need is God's Word. What we need is to live our lives by the Bible, and the importance of biblical living. And God, I pray that you help us to notice that, and to realize that, and then for us to make a decision and say, hey, Pastor, I am going to live my life by the Bible. I'm going to try my best. To live in such a way that pleases God. And God has laid out what pleases Him in His Word. And so I hope this is a, a blessing and help to your people this morning, Lord. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and power. And put aside uh, all, all these things, God, so that you can just speak through me. And get your message to your people. That, can, that it can help and encourage and challenge us this week. So that we can put it into practice. God, we love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Nehemiah chapter 8. What a magnificent chapter, an amazing chapter. We might read through the whole chapter here during the course of the sermon. If you guys can keep up with me, I'll do my best to go through that. But a few questions, and uh, some people have asked these questions before, and if we are going to get to the root of the matter, we need to ask these questions to ourselves. So, so a few questions that we need to ask is, does church matter? You know, why do we do what we do? Why do we get up and go to church on a Sunday? Why do we prioritize God in our life? Should we read the Bible? Is the Bible important? Should we, uh, is this just an old book of stories and fairy tales? Or is it something that we should live our lives by the Bible? Um, should we read the Bible? Not just have it, but read it. There are many churches, and I uh, think of the Catholic Church in particular, Catholics do not read their Bibles. They have a Bible. They know what it is. Uh, they'll see it read in the churches. But the people individually do not read their Bible. They're not encouraged to. And there's a, the reason why is because if people start reading their Bible, they'll come up to their priest and they'll say, Hey, um, um, I saw this in the Bible, but you know we're doing the opposite, so what's going on there? And so they're really scared of their people reading the Bible. And if you go back in history and you know your history where the Baptists came from, amen, we didn't come uh, – we, we, uh, the Baptists came uh, – have been – 
you know, since all the way back to John the Baptist, amen, there's always right. been people that have believed the Bible who were Bible believers. Maybe they didn't go by the name of Baptist, but they were people that said, hey, I believe the Bible. It doesn't matter what the church teaches. It doesn't matter what they say. I believe in God's word. And you had a period in history called the Dark Ages yeah. where the access to the Bible was not really there. And uh, you had the English language that came on the scene, and there was no Bible written in the English language. And so there was a man named William Tyndale who tried to uh, translate the Bible into the common language. Well, the church of the day, the Catholic Church and the Church of England and other churches, they were not happy about that. They did not want people to have the Bible. What they used to do, can you imagine, this is what they did. They would have a Bible, and they would have it chained to the pulpit yeah. because it can only be in church. You can only read the Bible in church. We don't, want, we don't want the Bible to be in your individual lives at home. We don't want you to be studying and reading the Bible, even though it says it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, to teach it to your children. No, we don't want that. We don't want you knowing what God's Word says because we don't want you to question us. We want to do what we want to do and tell you what it says, and you can trust us. We right. will tell you what God says, yeah. and you can see how that ended up, and that was not a good thing. And so William Tyndale tried to translate the Bible into English. He died for what he tried to do. And there were many, many uh, people who died trying to translate the Bible into English. There are many people that if they found you with one of these uh, very new translations into English when they started getting passed around, if you were found with one, they would take you and burn you at the stake. And a lot of times they would take the very Bible that you had uh, you know, risked your life for. They would take it and use it as fuel to start the fire that you would die at. And that's a true story. And thousands, and yet even millions of people died that way. And people don't know that. So the importance of the Word of God. Um, and so these questions we have to ask ourselves, because at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, why do I go to church? Why do I believe in God? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And if we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, then there comes a point when we're probably going to give up on God. We have to figure out the why. Once we know why, and we realize that, hey, this is the only way to live. There's no other way to live. This is the best way to live is by living your life by the Bible. And so it matters. And so here in Nehemiah chapter 8, you'll see they built the wall. They started to protect themselves from enemies. They gathered together because building the wall and you know building your home and, and uh, maybe living life morally, as many people in the world do today. Uh, I've seen very, very many professional people that have good marriages. They have good families. Their kids are doing well. They're teaching and training their kids the best they can. They're living moral, good moral lives. But if they don't have the Word of God, they're missing out. And so the Word of God is so important. And so here in Nehemiah chapter 8, they gather together as one man. What does that mean? Well, in unity. They're in unity around God's Word. And that's my first point is people unified around the importance of God's Word. Word. Amen. And that's what a church is and what a church does. We unify and we agree, hey, God's word is important. And so we unify around that and we come to church. We do come for fellowship, breaking of bread, amen. Or uh, that's what we had this morning, breaking of bread, those, those uh, bagels. Panera bread bagels, that's breaking bread, amen, praise God. And in prayers, and that's all good and wonderful, but the most important thing is the word of God. And so they gather together around that as one man to be in, and they were in unity around God's word. And God's people need to be in unity. Families need to be in unity. We need to be in unity with our church family. What should we be in unity at our church about? Pastor, what's important? What should we be in unity about? Well, we need to be in unity about God's Word. This is the Word of God, the preserved Word of God, and we need to agree on that. We need to be in unity about soul winning. Hey, getting the gospel to a lost and dying world matters. We need to be in unity around our pastor, amen? We can't be saying, well, uh, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and no, well, I'm of Jesus Christ, you know? Um, no, we need to make sure we're in unity, okay? Unity around our pastor. Uh, we need to be in unity around spiritual things, and unity around the church, and unity on holy living, and unity about reading our Bibles, and unity about praying, and unity about fellowship, and breaking of bread. And uh, that's why the importance, you know, you say, well, Pastor, why do we have food before church? You know, people can get their own food. Yes, I know that, but we want people to come together for that unity, for that fellowship, for that breaking of bread, just as I did in the book of Acts. And that helps bond us together. We spend more time together. It helps because if you're a mom with kids trying to get kids ready for church on a Sunday morning, uh, it's very nice if you can have church. Yeah, I guess some people, some moms are shaking their heads. If you can have some food, you can just show up at church and they'll have food for you. That's a help and a blessing to people. That helps me. And so that's why we do that. Um, in unity, and we come and we mourn together. 
know, this last week we had just two very sudden deaths, unexpected, um, in, in this last week. And uh, we come together and we mourn together. Um, and, uh, and that's something that we do together in unity. So number one, and there in verse 1 you see that they're in unity around God's word. Look at verse number 2. They had the word of God. Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. They had the word of God. Way back there in Nehemiah, in these in these olden times, if you will, um, they had the law of the word of God. And God has promised to preserve his word. Every generation has had God's word. In Psalms 12, verses 6 through 8, and you'll know these verses, and you should have them memorized. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. God promised to keep his words. We're not keeping his words. The church isn't preserving God's word. Now, God uses people to preserve his word, and he'll use the church. But it's not us doing it. It's God. God promised to preserve his word because it's his word. It's not our words. It's not man's words. God promised it, and you can trust God's word. Now, God's word is perfect. He promised to preserve his word, and it's perfect. James 1.25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. What is that law of liberty? That's the Bible. Psalm 19.7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. God's word is preserved for us today, and it's perfect. And it's found in the King James Bible. Amen. And so you see here, uh, they unified around the importance of God's word, and then they had the word of God. It's hard to be in unity around something that you don't have. You know, uh, if I said, hey, go, you know, we need to believe God's word, but we don't have God's word, that's just going to cause confusion. God didn't leave us without a Bible. God left us with his perfect, holy word, and I'm thankful for that. Look at verse number three. Verse three, and he read therein, in the word of God, before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. You say, Pastor, when does morning start? Well, probably when the sun came up. In the Bible, usually that's what it means. And so that would have been maybe 6 a.m. till uh, 12 p.m., right? Uh, is that right? Yeah, so six hours, somewhere in there. Um, that, that's a lot of reading. Um, I don't know if I can stand up here and read God's Word out loud for six hours. Maybe they had to take turns. Uh, you think our church services are long. Oh, boy, my kids, every time after church, Myra comes up to me and says, Dad, that takes too long. Uh, she says that almost every time I finish preaching. It doesn't matter how long it goes or how short it goes. Even if I didn't preach and uh, someone else preached, uh, she says, Dad, that was too long. Um, but this was a long service right here. You read the New Testament of Paul preaching till past midnight, and the guy fell asleep in the window in the third loft and fell out and pretty much died, and Paul had to go revive him, right? Uh, we don't do services that long, praise God. But here at Nehemiah, they, they uh, met for hours and read God's word to all the people that could hear and that could understand. And they were interested in it. Look at the end of verse 3. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So they paid attention. You know, uh, today in this day and age, uh, we have an epidemic, if you will, of uh, people with short attention spans. And uh, there's reasons for that. Uh, you have the entertainment industry and movies and kids' cartoons and things like that. Uh, we have a generation of kids that are, are taught to have a lack of attention, no attention. They can, you have to jump around and do crazy stuff to keep their attention. And it's a very short attention span. But for us as adults, and especially if we have children, we can teach them. But as adults, we should be able to, to sit down and pay attention to at least, you know, an hour service. That shouldn't be asking too much. I mean, you can sit there and pay attention to a movie for three hours long, and I'd blink an eye, and I'd even miss the time I'm passing, right? I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. I've done it before. And uh, we can certainly pay attention to God's word and to preaching. Now, it's not easy. I've been there in church and church service before, and I've sat in church my whole life, so I know. And uh, I'm thinking about, you know, what I'm going to do tomorrow. Or uh, when I'm going to get my next chance of going golfing or playing chess or whatever it may be, and your mind can wander, right? And so it's a discipline. You have to, hey, sometimes you don't, don't actually slap yourself in church. But if that's what you have to do, praise God, do it. Uh, just do it where you don't distract me. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad used to reach over and he would uh, pinch us on our leg if we started falling asleep. And so uh, that, that was my dad's way of waking us up. And um, But for us as adults, hey, let's challenge ourselves. Let's work and try our best. To pay attention. It's not always easy, 
But here in Nehemiah, they paid attention to God's word. It's hard to learn from God's word if you don't pay attention to it. You know, you've taken the time to put on your Sunday clothes and, and uh, taken time out of your day and spent gas and money to drive here. And you've taken the time to be here. So if you've done all that, hey, let's pay attention at the preaching time. Let's not let that go to waste. Let's not spend all that time in preparation. And then it doesn't even help us because we weren't paying attention. And maybe that sermon could have changed our life in some way. And yet we weren't paying attention. And there's been times I, at the end of the service, I'm trying to remember what the pastor was preaching about. And that's, that, that happens. But let's, hey, let's remind ourselves we need to be attentive to God's word. Here in Nehemiah, they were attentive to God's word. Now why? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The only way to get faith is by hearing God's word. And so that's why we've got to pay attention so that we can hear it. Amen. James chapter 1 verse 23 tells us, For if any be a hearer of the word, so they heard it, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And uh, we can hear God's word, but then if we don't do it, it doesn't really do us that much good. And so there's a difference between uh, listening to somebody and hearing them. And uh, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes our wives will start uh, telling us, you know, what they encounter during the day. And we're like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. And our mind's totally somewhere else, and then they say, you weren't paying attention, were you? And I was like, oh, yes, I was. Well, what did I say? Uh, well, uh, I think you were talking about you went to the store and spent some money. And, and nope, nope, that wasn't what they were talking about. And so sometimes we hear, but we're not listening, okay? And if you have children, who you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they hear you, and they just look at you, and they have no clue what you're talking about. I'll say, Luke, take out the trash. And then he's just like, What? And he doesn't know anything that I said. His mind's just a million miles away. And uh, so we need to make sure that, hey, we're, we're not just there and hearing, but we're listening to God's word. The most important thing is God's word. We need to listen to it. And so you see these people were interested in hearing God's word. Look at verses 5. Jump down there and verse 4 to give you some people. And Well, actually, let's look at verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. Now, why did they make a pulpit of wood? Well, because there was a lot of people there, okay? Uh, if you have a group of, you know, maybe less than 100 people, you don't really need to be high up off the ground for people to see you. Right. But let's say you're in Jerusalem, and you've got all the people there, and there's, now, you know, a couple thousand, thousands of people there. Uh, the people in the back aren't going to be able to see him or hear him, so he needs to be up and elevated to get his voice out, okay? And so that's why they had a pulpit of wood there in Nehemiah chapter number 4. And I love the word pulpit. We use the same word today, and I like that. Look at verse number 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. You say, Pastor, why do you ask us to stand when you open God's word to read? Well, it's out of a reverence and respect for God's word. And it's right there in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Amen. When he opened God's word, guess what? The people stood up and they read God's word. And that's exactly what we do here today. And that's amazing. Um, and Ezra opened God's word. Now, I've preached before, and I preach out of, out of notes that I print out, and uh, I think I preached one time, and I have the Word of God, God's words, written down on the paper, but I had forgotten to open my Bible. And so a pastor, a preacher mentioned that to me, and he said, make sure you always open your Bible so that people see it. And, uh, and I will never forget that, because even though I might have God's Word written down on a paper, we need to make sure that we're seeing as, hey, let's all open the Bible together. Even though pastor reads it, you need to open your Bible yourself as well because you need to see it for yourself in your own Bible. You can underline things and things like that, and we all need to make sure we open God's Word together and uh, have that respect and reverence for God's Word. You see that in verse number 5. Look in verse 6 there. Uh, all the people have stood up in verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. He prayed. Amen. Amen. You say, Pastor, why do you uh, open the Bible and we read and then you pray? Well... It goes all the way back to Nehemiah. And he, uh, Ezra blesses God, the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered. That's your part right there. Okay. You got to there. There's two amens. So that's y'all are the people. So Ezra blesses the Lord, the great God. And all the people said. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. There we go. Two amens. Praise God. And you say, Pastor, what is this amen thing in church? Maybe, you know, you're new in church. Uh, people just, like, say amen loud sometimes. <laughs> what is that, right? Well, we get that right out of the Bible. And all amen means is I agree. And 
it's encouraging the preacher, and it's saying, hey, that's good stuff. I like that. That's out of the Bible. It's out of the Bible word, and that's where we get it from. It's good to say amen in church. You can say amen in church. Um, it's much, well, not as much as you want. If all you do is say amen constantly and, and nobody can hear me, that's probably too much. But um, definitely be wise. And, and if pastor is, you know, giving maybe uh, a story or illustration that's a negative story, you might not want to say amen. Uh, we had a guy um, in our church. Um, we call him Hallelujah Bob Mansfield. And he, he really can't hear very well. And uh, you go, I've known him for uh, maybe seven years or so. Um, and he really can't hear well. So you go to him and you'll say, hey, Brother Bob. And he, so you have to like yell right next to him. Well, during the service, what he does is he'll sit, you know, front row and he'll say, hallelujah. He's a real old guy, you know, talk kind of slow from the mountains in, in West Virginia. And uh, he'll just say, hallelujah. Well, Brother Bob, he, he jokes around with my dad and asks him, he says, Ash, you just got to let me know um, in case I say hallelujah at the wrong time. <laughs> and sometimes you'll be in church and you'll, you'll you know, pastor will make an announcement. He'll be saying, hey, you know, um, just want to make an announcement. Uh, we have a funeral this Saturday. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it'll just happen at the wrong time. Uh, but praise the Lord, I, I like Brother Bob. And uh, hearing that hallelujah is encouraging. It encourages the preacher when you say amen. And so do those things. Praise God. We see that amen. here in Nehemiah chapter 8 with lifting up their hands. Amen. And sometimes you'll see people amen. say amen. And they'll do that. And that's good. And they bow their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. But what you see here is a reverence and respect. For God's word. It wasn't a joking time. Um, although we have fun at church and pastors will sometimes make jokes, um, it is a very serious matter. And uh, it's for something very important the importance of the word of God. And you see that with these people the reverence, the respect. The, when the word of God was open, they stood up. And when they were, uh, he was preaching the word of God, they said, Amen. They lifted up their hands, they bowed down their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. A respect and reverence for God's word and for God. Um, and then jump down, if you will, with me. Um, so it names some people in verse 7. Uh, but at the end of verse 7, it says, And the Levites, they caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. And then in verse 8, it gives us a description. And verse 8 tells us exactly what preaching is. <clears throat> this is what you're preaching God's word. This is your goal right here in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 8. This is what a preacher is trying to do. Look at verse 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. There's three things there, and we'll draw your attention to, is they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. They read it clearly. Um, as a preacher, we want to make sure people can hear the word of God, and they know the word of God. Yeah. But a pastor doesn't just come up here and just read the Bible. And the Bible's good, amen. But there has to be more than that, okay? And here's why. Throughout all of history, God has always used a spokesperson to carry his message to the people. Mm -hmm. You say, why do we have church? Why do we have pastors? Uh, everyone has the word of God. Um, they should just be able to live their life by the Bible by themselves. Well, God has always used a leader to lead his people. Going all the way back to uh, Noah, and uh, you have Enoch preaching even before that. And then you have Moses, and you have guys like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, men who led their families. They led people pointed them to God, uh, to God, you see Moses, you see Joshua, then you see all the judges that came along, and Gideon, and men like that, and then you see Saul, and then you see King David. God always used a spokesperson to get his message out, and for many years in the Bible, it was the prophets that gave God's message out. In the New Testament, he gave it to the apostles, and then he appointed pastors um, and to carry his message out, and that's always been God's plan. So the pastor, he will read the book of law of God distinctly, and then he will give the sense now, what that means is he sort of tells you the story. He tells you maybe the back, uh, the back story to it, what happened before. He puts it in perspective. Hey, Pastor, where does this, this story fit in Nehemiah? Who is Nehemiah? What is he trying to do? And so the pastor will give, or the preacher will give a sense of the story and make you sort of see the time frame. Maybe he'll draw a mental picture by describing the city, the walls being broken down, and the fire, and all those things. He'll do that so that you understand the context. And then the third thing that he'll do, it says, and cause them to understand the reading. And so after he reads the word of God, he gives the back, background story, gives you the picture of what's going on in the context. Then he'll try to give you the understanding. This is what it means. This is how you apply it to your life. This is how 
this passage written thousands of years ago can help you in 2023 in Hampton, Virginia. And so the pastor will try again, help you to understand God's word. And that's a picture of an Old Testament service of a preacher preaching God's word and the goal that they're trying to do. And, and we'll continue on the chapter in just a moment. But first of all, I said uh, uh, the people unified around the importance of God's word. Number two, they had the word of God. Praise God. They had access to God's word. We have access to God's word today. Amen. Don't take that for granted. Uh, and then thirdly, they were inter the people were interested in hearing God's word, and they paid attention. Now, that's not easy. You think those people had busy lives? Oh, yeah. You think they had kids? Oh, yes, they did. And you'll notice there in, in the second verse, it says, uh, let's see, they gathered men and women and all that could hear with understanding. So it seems like maybe uh, maybe they had something for the crying infants that could not hear without understanding. Maybe they were somewhere else. Maybe they uh, maybe they uh, put them in little baskets in the water like Moses. I don't know what they did, um, but they all unified together, and they were paying attention. They put distractions aside as best they could, and even the little ones, you know, kids can understand. Um, I want to say kids should love preaching. Uh, my children, you know, four, you know, let's see, Myers three, four, and six, they can understand God's word, and they should also be allowed to be in preaching. And I encourage that. Uh, we shouldn't have that preaching time where all the kids go play and they don't hear preaching. No, we need to teach our children to love preaching from a very early age. If they can understand me, they can understand preaching, amen? And so I love having them in here, and they learn, and they grow in that, and that's wonderful. Um, and so they were attentive to God's word. They put away the jobs. They put away all of their uh, things they were trying to do on the side. And they took time to hear God's word for hours and hours. Um, and then they had a reverence and respect for God's word. And then lastly, because of they took all these steps in this preparation, that now God's word was able to have an impact on their life. Look at verse number 8. Verse 8. And Nehemiah, uh, oh, well, we just read verse 8. Jump down, if you will, with me to verse 9. And Nehemiah, which is the church, Shatha, and Ezra, Ezra the, Christ, uh, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, more not nor weak. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. When they heard God's word and the truth of God's word and how what they were doing was wrong and they needed to get right and how they were missing out on the blessings of God, it caused them to weep. It had an impact on their life. Verse 10, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stood all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And look in verse 12, the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. When you understand God's word and you learn something, you take it home and you say, hey, I remember that and that helped me and I understand what God's word is saying. That's something to be excited about. Amen. That brings happiness. You say, wow, God wrote this thousands of years ago for me today? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely he did. And that's an amazing thing. And we should be thankful for that. And the word of God had an impact on their life. Too yeah. often, people skip all the first steps, and they say, well, I went to church, Pastor, but, you know, uh, it, it didn't help me, or that church didn't help me grow. I wasn't being fed at that church, and I've heard that before. I've heard many people say that, right? Well, maybe it wasn't the preacher's fault. Maybe right. you didn't think God's Word was important in your life, and all you did was, you know, you brought, you dusted off the dust off your Bible on Sunday morning, brought it to the, to the church basically as a... Uh, as an extra piece of apparel or clothing um, that you wore on your on Sundays, and you opened it up. But in your life, God's Word wasn't important, so that's why it didn't help you. Or maybe uh, you didn't think you had the Word of God. You thought, hey, there's errors in this, so why should I read it? It's not perfect, or maybe that was the problem. Or maybe you weren't interested in hearing God's Word, or you weren't attentive. You came to church, took all that time effort and energy to be here, but you just let your mind wander, and you didn't learn anything in church. Or maybe you didn't have the reverence and respect for God's Word, that you should have. Or maybe uh, maybe you messed up on one of those steps there, and so you never got to God's Word making an impact on your life, and you missed out on the last part. Right. Well, you do all those things, God's Word will impact you. God's Word will be a blessing to you and help you in a great way. Look down um, in verse number 18 of Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 18. Also day by day, from the first day, Unto the last day, 
He read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. You mean they met for seven days straight for, to read God's word? Oh, yeah, they did. This was a revival right here. This is what you call an old-fashioned, uh, maybe they were in tents, maybe it was a tent meeting, an uh, old-fashioned Jerusalem revival here with Nehemiah and Ezra, the priest. And they met for seven days. So in, in light of that, we're going to meet here tomorrow all day to read God's word. I'm just kidding. Uh, people, that would be exciting. And that's why we have special events and days and revivals and, and church services that are during the week as well. But they met for seven days. Why? Because God's word was important in their lives. They wanted to know what God said so that they could live their lives by the Bible. And it makes a difference. You know, uh, people come to church and, and we're fighting spiritual battles. And spiritual battles matter. And if we're not living our lives by the Bible, then all sorts of problems can happen. And we can get way off course and we can really mess our lives up and we can hurt other people. And we can make some big, huge mistakes if we don't live our lives by the Bible. Make God's word important in your life. Make uh, challenge yourself to live your life by the Bible. And maybe uh, you you uh, one of these steps here you need to grow or work on. Hey, maybe it's paying attention in church. Maybe it's having that awe and reverence and respect for God's word. And maybe it's looking at it like, hey, Sunday is the most important day of the week. It's the most important time of my life. My job that's not as important as going to church. I will never take a job you know where I have to work on a Sunday or have to miss church. Church and, read, and hearing God's word is more important. And maybe you need to make that more important in your life. Or maybe you need to uh, have that reverence and respect for God and his word. That this is a precious and holy thing. And maybe you need to lift that up in your mind. But whatever it may be, work on those things so that you can be impacted by God's word. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we love you. We need you, Lord. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would help us to uh, continue to live our lives by the Bible. To teach our children the importance of your word and the importance of living uh, biblical lives, God. Help us to center our homes and our lives around the Bible. God, help me to grow as I try to lead my family as well into centering our lives around the Bible, God. I want it to be a focal point in our lives. <clears throat> and God, I pray that you help us as a church to uh, never get to the point where we get into social programs and all these other things that might be good things, but... Help us not make those the focus of our church, God. The focus and the central point of an Insula Baptist church is the Word of God. And I pray that you keep it that way for uh, as long as we are here on this earth, God. I pray that you keep it that way. And God, help us um, as we agree with that at church, that the Bible is the most important thing, and that's the center. Help us to do that in our homes. And help us to do that in our personal lives as well. And God, I pray that our co-workers and uh, everyone we meet, can see that the Bible is first and foremost in our lives, Lord. God, we love you. We need you. We thank you for your uh, just word of God and the encouragement it is to us this morning, Lord. Please be with this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to take a moment and, and sit there in your seat and just talk to the Lord and, and tell him, hey, I want to live my life by the Bible.
God's word important in your life. And I promise you, you will not regret it. You will not get to heaven and say, man, I wish I, wish I would have gone to church less so that I could go fishing on Sunday. Man, I really missed out. No, in heaven, you probably go fishing in the, you know, the crystal sea up there, amen? And you probably catch a fish every cast. Perfect. Amen. You might not enjoy fishing anymore if it was that easy. But uh, who knows? We'll see if we get to heaven. But I'm thankful that you came to church this morning. Pray that you all have a wonderful afternoon. And we'll see you guys back here tonight at the appointed time service this evening. It's going to be great. You won't want to miss it. Pray the Lord, Brother Mike, can you close us in prayer, please? Yep. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Father, uh, for the opportunity to come to church, Lord. Help us to reverence uh, our time in your house, Lord.